Although psychology as a research subject hasn't been around for very long, it's already had its share of horrifyingly unethical experiments. You're probably aware of Milgram shock experiment, maybe even the Stanford prison experiment that took place in the early 70s, but what if I was to tell you that this is merely the tip of the iceberg? In the video today, we are going to show you our pick for 5 lesser known messed up experiments in psychology that you could not do today. So, at the risk of inspiring memories of childhood inadequacy in our viewers, we now have a case of systematic cruelty to children in the appropriately named Monster Study. Most scientists, well actually most people, wince at the idea of causing harm to anyone, especially children. Unfortunately, some poorly designed studies may cause harm to children as an unintended consequence of bad methodology or poor safeguarding measures. It burns. But in 1939, our friends Wendell Johnson and Mary Tudor at the University of Iowa decided to make bullying orphans a central part of their research. Yes, orphan children, is there a more vulnerable demographic? The study was aiming to examine stuttering in children by comparing the effect of one of two conditions on their speech fluency. Ten of these 22 children involved had been assessed as having a stutter prior to testing. In one condition, they gave the children, stutter or not, positive speech therapy, where their efforts and successes were praised. Okay, no problems so far. But the other half of the orphans were belittled and criticised whenever they spoke to see if that would help, by professionals, as their actual job. They were paid for this. And this is regardless of whether they actually had a stutter. Even if their speech was perfectly fluent, they were told, quote, The staff has come to the conclusion that you have a great deal of trouble with your speech. You have many of the symptoms of a child who is beginning to stutter. You must try to stop yourself immediately. Use your willpower. Do anything to keep from stuttering. Don't ever speak unless you can do it right. You see how blank stutters, don't you? Well, he undoubtedly started this very same way. Well, as you might expect, this was a disaster for the children in the bullying condition. Those with prior speech issues got worse, and many children developed speech impediments where they previously didn't have one. And so attempting to imitate something resembling human decency, the researchers did eventually tell those children that they didn't actually have a stutter. And to relax, as it was all just a silly experiment, and those mental scars will heal in no time. But this wasn't before many of them had become withdrawn and anxious. So in 1940, after the conclusion of the research, Mary Tudor said, I believe that in time they will recover, but we certainly made a definite impression on them. Eventually, in 2007, seven of those children were awarded $1.2 million compensation, and the University of Iowa made a public apology, denouncing the experiment as indefensible in any era. The humble pursuit of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. Freud, father of pop psychology and pseudoscience, often gets a bad rap in academic circles for basically being a coke adult philosopher rather than an actual scientist. And though his theories today are often ridiculed for their pseudoscientific nature, he did actually have some groundbreaking ideas. Ideas such as convincing his patients to have their noses scarred to alleviate trauma from childhood sexual abuse. In fairness, this idea was not entirely of Freud's making. Nasal reflex disorder was dreamt of by Wilhelm Fleisch and supposed that the genitals were connected to the nose. Seeing as patients diagnosed with NRD had their depression alleviated by snorting cocaine, because, well, of course it does, Fleisch naturally summarised that cauterization of the nose could potentially lead to permanent results. Freud himself was a fan of this method, and also ingested cocaine for his own medical anaesthetization, orphan and game so far. That is, until Freud, almost definitely hopelessly addicted to cocaine at this point, referred one Emma Eckstein, later celebrated as the first female psychoanalyst, to remove her turbinate bone to cure her postmenstrual depression. It's important to stress that there is no known medical benefit of removing a nose to cure postmenstrual depression today, and neither was there in the late 1800s. This was, in essence, an ongoing experiment. Emma Eckstein's surgery was botched. Fleisch, probably off his head on cocaine also, even forgot to remove medical gauze from her nose. Eckstein hemorrhaged profusely and suffered from a lingering infection, the left side of her face eventually caving in. All around, pretty terrible. What's worse is following the incident, Freud eventually tried to shift the blame from his cavalier friend Fleisch and claimed the initial symptoms were likely resultant from hysteria and not R&D. Who could have predicted? Eckstein went on to publish the book The Sexual Enlightenment of Children and is often overlooked in the history of psychoanalytics. Really, this video is as much of a look at awful people as it is a video about awful experiments. 
Take our friend Walter Freeman, who is sometimes referred to by the terrifying title, The Godfather of the Lobotomy. His experimental procedures were so gruesome that you'd be forgiven for thinking he was intentionally trying to kill his lobotomy patients. In fact, he often did. If you've never heard of a lobotomy, lucky you, then it involves putting this under here in an attempt to turn this into this. Okay, more precisely, the procedure aimed to sever the connections to problematic patients' frontal lobes to stabilize their personality, leaving them without the burden of silly things like higher order thoughts, planning, or the faculty of reason. I have a little surprise for you. Is that a chicken? However, this experimental procedure, which was one big twisted experiment arguably, commonly resulted in patients either being left in a vegetative state with infant-like behaviours or uh, dead. Oh, okay. Even more horrifying than this was that psychiatric hospitals performed thousands of lobotomies in the late 40s purely on the basis that vegetative people were easier to manage than aggressive or impulsive people. Not a very ethical solution. But wait, it gets worse. These procedures were often carried out either without the consent or against the wishes of the patients in question. Truly nightmarish stuff. Fortunately, lobotomies began to decrease in popularity in the 1950s, and Walter Freeman performed his final one in 1967. Did Freeman never get an innocent tap on the shoulder from his conscience, asking if this was a dignified way to treat a fellow human being? It's genuinely disturbing. The use of rats in laboratory experiments doesn't exactly fill most people with joy. Hopefully the idea of causing the minimum necessary harm to animals isn't a particularly controversial idea to you, even if those animals are plague-carrying flea bags who indirectly cause the death of more people than the First World War. That said, I think many people would argue this was a necessary evil. Maybe this was the logic of the School of Medicine in Lyon, France, when they used cute little bundles of fluff to test the effect of paradoxical sleep. You've probably heard of sleep paralysis. Unless you've studied psychology, you're probably not aware though, everybody, unless you have some kind of sleep disorder, experiences sleep paralysis every time you sleep. This paralysis works to stop you acting out your dreams or falling off a cliff and drowning, or so the theory goes. However, in the early stages of sleep, an SWS, this mechanism is not active. Well, in a particularly cruel study, psychologists sought to deny REM sleep to some innocent baby kittens by balancing them on upturned flower pots floating in water. As they began to fall asleep, the kittens would lose their muscle tone, fall into the water, instantly waking them up and denying them sleep. Pretty terrible. Well, it gets worse. Although some of the cats were then promptly removed, groomed and allowed some well-earned sleep, Others had to suffer the ordeal again, up to 26 days. And still, those were the lucky ones. A further group of cats underwent brain alterations, but we'll spare you the details. Messed up as the study was, it had some genuinely interesting findings. But yeah, lobotomizing and half-drowning kittens for science, not mega cool. The Ethics Code of the American Psychological Association is as follows. Informed consent, psychologists inform their participants about 1. The purpose of the research, expected duration and procedures, 2. Their right to decline to participate and to withdraw from the research once the participation has begun, 3. The foreseeable consequences of declining or withdrawing, 4. Reasonably foreseeable factors that may be expected to influence their willingness to participate, such as potential risks, discomfort, or adverse effects, 5. Any prospective research benefits, 6. Limits of confidentiality, 7. Incentives for participation, and 8. Whom to contact for questions about the research and research participants' rights. They provide opportunity for the prospective participants to ask questions and receive answers. Basically, where possible, inform your participant of what the study entails, its risks, and if you have to deceive, don't be a milgram. One group with which particular care must be taken with are those with mental illness, in this case schizophrenia. Beginning in 1983, a group of researchers at UCLA were interested in investigating potential predictors of relapse-related psychosis. The experiment among other conditions required 23 of 50 participants to cease taking their medication after a specific time frame, one of the justifications being perhaps some of the patients better off without their medication. Schizophrenia medications such as fluorezephine, used in the study, can indeed have uncomfortable side effects. 
Common side effects of proloxin, fluorizophine, include drowsiness, lethargy, dizziness, nausea, loss of appetite, sweating, dry mouth, blurred vision, headache, or constipation. Tell your doctor if you have serious side effects of prolozy, including feelings of restlessness, mask like facial expression, greatly increased Stop! sight, tremors, unusual mental slash mood changes such as depression, worsening of psychosis, confusion, urination, difficulty in vision problems, weight changes, swelling of the feet or ankles, oh my God, skin discoloration, butterfly shaped facial rash, joint pain, or seizures. In the end, several of the participants relapsed with symptoms of paranoia and hallucinations. The controversy of this study is less in the fact that the participants relapsed, this was of course expected, but rather in the lack of consent and severity of the danger the participants were placed in. In 1991, Antonio Tony La Madrid, a participant in the study, having been taken off his medication, tragically died in a presumed suicide after falling from the roof of a nine-storey building. In their report on the matter, the National Institutes of Health failed to comply with the requirements of the HHS regulations. When interviewed in the aftermath of the study, many reported it never being made clear to them how significant a risk of severe relapse they could potentially suffer. Thanks for watching.